Sports Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. Here's what we have in store for you on this May 28th, 2013 edition. Tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News. Over the weekend, the Monsanto March was in 436 cities and 52 countries. Yet, not a peep from the whitewash media. You won't see NBC, CBS, ABC, any of the ABC corporations, you know, alphabet news agencies here. Does being slowly poisoned to death mean anything to anybody? Then, Gibson guitars targeted by the IRS. But it's the IRS that must fess up to the allegations of illegal wood. Plus, Scotland wants every child to have a state guardian for life. All that and more on the InfoWars Nightly News. And welcome back. Top story headline, send John McCain to Guantanamo Bay. I like that. I like that graphic like there, right there. This is from our very own Paul Joseph Watson. Given the fact that numerous individuals have been sent to Guantanamo Bay detention facility for, quote, associating with terrorists, Senator John McCain has now opened himself up to the same fate after he met with the FSA rebels in Syria. McCain's visit coincided with an EU decision to scrap the arms embargo on the Syrian opposition, clearing the way for Britain and France to send heavy weaponry to the rebels at a time when the Syrian army troops are scoring key victories. Now, I want to scroll down a little bit in the article and just show you some of the bullet points, some of the highlights of the Free Syrian Army, a.k.a. Al-Qaeda. Now, you can see them right there on your screen, and I do encourage you to look at them all, but we'll just hit a few. Let's see. Uh, FSA rebels have been filmed singing songs that glorify Osama bin Laden. We'll jump down a little bit. FSA rebels have also forced children to behead people. Uh, they've ransacked Christian churches, and they have been pictured numerous times flying the black flag of Al-Qaeda. And you say, hold on, so John McCain's going to hang out with Al-Qaeda. Aren't we fighting Al-Qaeda? Yes, that's the whole point. Uh, Al-Qaeda, who, you know, has been the big boogeyman since 9-11, now they're hanging out with, uh, with these Al-Qaeda rebels in Syria, trying to get them arms and so forth. And just take this into consideration. Take the, uh, the recent Boston bombing suspects. Once again, I'm not vouching for those guys. I'm just using them as an example. The people associated with these Boston bombers are either dead or in jail. The oldest brother's associate uh, was killed by the FBI after some type of uh, altercation. Then you have the criminal mastermind 19-year-olds uh, locked up because they were associated with these people. And once again, I'm not encouraging locking people up and uh, you know, shooting them after a supposed altercation. But we see John McCain, he's going out hanging out with the Free Syrian Army who, uh, you know, they're giving guns and AK-47s and uh, machetes and dynamite to little children and allowing them to play. But when John McCain goes and does it, it's just fine. This just after Memorial Day, when we have people who, we, people in this country actually want to embrace our veterans and people who have died for this country. Meanwhile, the Free Syrian Army is trying to kill our troops and not just our troops, but just general everyday people killing civilians and so forth. So uh, John McCain, I'm pretty sure uh, if you ever need a spot, you know, a nice place to stage, uh, Guantanamo Bay will be just the place for you. He spent about an hour meeting with five different rebel commanders who came from all over Syria to plead with him for heavier weapons, a no-fly zone, and airstrikes against the forces of President Bashar al-Assad. They also repeated their claims that the Assad regime has used chemical weapons. Now, McCain has been one of the most outspoken supporters of arming the Syrian rebels. Yeah, Army and uh, Al-Qaeda, that's uh, Senator John McCain. We'll move on now to some Monsanto coverage. Media coverage blackout over Monsanto protest. Protest, excuse me. Now, I guess that's a lack of coverage because we've been reporting on this uh, since this past week, and we have the March on Monsanto, and there's actually one activist, one Anthony Gucciardi. And once again, we are the only news organization here covering this. You won't see NBC, CBS, ABC, any of the ABC corporations, you know, alphabet news agencies here filming this event because the reality is that they don't want to sell the fact that Monsanto is tainting the food supply and of course because Monsanto has over 500 individuals and in key positions within the government and the media. And only six corporations own thousands of not only newspapers and news channels but internet websites as well that spin themselves as alternative news but in fact of course they peddle GMOs and claim it's scientific. 
I mean, you look around in these buildings, it's, it's amazing to see the contrast. These buildings, they represent many things that were once great about this country, but also, in a sense, they represent many of the corruption-based uh, corporations that this group and others are fighting against. But at the same time, you have so many people in various ways with uh, the Stop on Satan posters and others. Seek Truth, Infowars.com, this guy has up here. Of course, Alex Jones, Infowars. That guy looks like he uh, was grown out of the cornfield, Monsanto's cornfields, and had some type of deformity when they mixed the insect genes inside the crops. And for more on that, we have joined us via Skype, Mr. Anthony Gucciardi. And thanks for joining us, Anthony. Hey, great to be uh, back on with you guys. Okay, now tell us why you went to the one in Philadelphia as opposed to the one here in Austin. Well, you know, I was scheduled to go to the one in Austin and potentially be a speaker, but I ended up traveling for family reasons. As you can tell, I'm not in my studio right now. I'm on the road. Right. And I'm glad I did, though, because I ended up going to the Philadelphia one where there was no news media at all. I mean, the whole entire event would have gone down the memory hole if we didn't have a camera crew on me at the time going down to the uh, Market Street, which is the busiest street in the whole city. I mean, there was a thousand plus people. Some people say it was around 2,000. I don't have a count, obviously, but it was a lot. Going down the busiest street in Philadelphia, which is a major city, you know, it's one of the top five, I believe. It's the, one of the largest cities in the United States, obviously. And the news media didn't have anything to say about it. I mean, they, they covered a cat up in a tree in the local <laughs> yeah. news. There was literally a cat in a tree that they were covering and saying how great firefighters are from Memorial Day and stuff like that. But they didn't, they didn't even want to talk about the 1,000 plus people walking down the street on the busiest street in Philadelphia. So I'm glad I actually went up and covered it or else it would have been lost forever. And it's just one of those things because, you know, often they'll say, well, nobody told us about it. I mean, how can you not see a thousand plus people marching down the street in unison, chanting no GMOs and so forth? We had a chance to watch a video, at least I did a little bit earlier. Now, there's one part in particular I want to ask you about. I believe uh, it was towards the end of your video. You had a couple of skateboarders out there and, you know, these guys approach you or maybe you approach them and they say, hey, what is this all about? Why are all these people out here? And you tell, start to tell them about GMOs and another gentleman chimes in and says, hey, you guys don't know about GMOs. Can you tell us uh, how that came about? So that was one of the most inspiring parts is people would come up and say, hey, what's going on? You know, they would want to be on camera, too. So there was a bunch of passerbys that weren't part of the march, and they would just be like, hey, I want to be on TV. You know, they didn't, they didn't really know exactly what group we're with. I said, all right, you know, let's talk. And we would inform random people. They would just come up, like uh, dozens of people would come up and say, hey, what's going on? What's, what, do you, what are you filming? And myself or someone from the audience in the March Against Monsanto would say, hey, you know, we're here against Monsanto, and here's the data, here's the information. And they would say, wow, I didn't know that. You know, I'm going to go home and check that out, and I had no idea I was even eating GMOs. So that's probably the most inspiring part for me, is that there was actually awareness, a generation of awareness on a major scale from people, by the way, that you wouldn't even know knew about GMOs in the first place. I mean, like yeah, I said Yeah, you in the mentioned video, in the video how you had some biker-type guys out there and a bunch of other people who, you know, you just wouldn't expect to see at this type of rally. There was literally like a biker gang there, and uh, they had signs and everything like that. And we had people, you know, you would think that in, in a city like that, and I've lived here pretty much all my life. I live in Austin now, but I grew up here. And I know a lot of people around here, and I thought, you know, there's not really going to be that much of a turnout because we're inner city. I mean, no one cares about what they're eating, I thought. You know, not a lot of people. But the people I found and talked to, they're so informed. You know, they're fans of InfoWars. There was a guy with an InfoWars.com sign. Mm -hmm. It said, like, Seek Truth InfoWars or something like that. Came up and said, hey, you know, I, I remember you from InfoWars and everything like that. There's so many people in your daily life. If you go to the supermarket or go outside or whatever, about 9 out of 10 of those people, honestly have some degree of information, they're completely awake to some degree, but they don't want to show it because they feel ashamed. But when something happens like a march against Monsanto and they can go and get support with thousands of other people, they're going to do it. And that's what is awesome about, you know, what you guys are doing, what I'm doing, what others are doing, is we're tapping into this amazing pool of uh, energy from these people. You know, they come out and they, they did their activism and it's amazing, but they're not going to do it unless you say, hey, come out and do it because they're ashamed and they think that no one else knows when in reality, so many people are aware of what's going on. Yeah, because that's the thing. A lot of people will think, hey, uh, if I show up at this event, I'm going to be the only person there or maybe be one or two conspiracy theorists and they're afraid of things like that. But that, what you just saw right there on your screen, if you're watching, was a great example. You saw thousands of people marching together peacefully. And speaking of peacefully, now you said, Anthony, across the street, 
right across the street from this Monsanto March, there was a gun rally. And I believe you said that there was maybe one or two officers escorting all these thousands of people for the Monsanto rally, but this uh, smaller group of people at the gun rally had uh, how many officers would you estimate? Yeah, in the video, we were doing March Against Monsanto, and we were only planning on doing March Against Monsanto. And then I look over the street, and I see another rally with uh, actually the ex-Secret Service guy, Dan Bongino, I believe his name was. Um, Larry Pratt was there. Oh. And I look over there, and I said, hey, what's, what's going on? There must be a pro-gun rally. And they say, yeah, sure enough, that's a pro-gun rally. And I noticed something, that there was an extreme amount of not only police, but people in military uniforms and Homeland Security there over at the gun rally when there was maybe 50 people, because it started at like 8 a.m. or something, according to some of the people I talked to. And at that point, I guess it was late afternoon. And there was like 20-something officers just standing right in front of it, staring at the pro-gun rally. There was Homeland Security, unmarked cop uh, vehicles with canine units. And there was military going behind the event. And there was like people watching from all corners, surrounding it completely. And here you have March Against Monsanto, a thousand plus people marching down the busiest street mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. And there was, yeah, a cop in the front, with a vehicle directing because they had a permit and a cop in the back. And in the actual march where they were rallying and getting together and chanting down with Monsanto and, and stuff that you know they should be somewhat concerned about if they were looking for anything, mm -hmm. um, there was one cop on, on the very side of the, of the entire rally of 1,000 plus people. But the 50 people with guns, they are treated as complete terrorists, anyone oh, yeah. that dares to exercise their right. And they all had carry, uh, you know, permits and licenses and everything. Mm -hmm. They were just there open carrying their pistols, and they were treated like complete terrorists. I actually asked the cops, you know, why are you over here? And they said, oh, you know, don't worry about it. You know, go ask our public policy officer. They don't want to talk about it. But the yeah. real, you can see where the real fight is. I support, you know, the March Against Monsanto. I've been a huge... Um, you know, cheerleader for it and saying how great it is. But in the reality, the real fight, you can see where it is when you look at where the police are concerned about, where their higher ups are telling them to go and watch for those evil domestic terrorists who dare to exercise their Second Amendment. Exactly. Now, Anthony, tell us how people can keep up with you. Definitely. So I have my natural health site, which is naturalsociety.com, and then I have my more political, like gun rights site, which is storyleak.com. All right. Anthony Gucciardi, thank you for your time, sir. Thanks a lot. And not to be outdone, InfoWars had a dog in a fight when we attended the March on Monsanto here in Austin. Organizers of the March Against Monsanto event said that more than 2 million people in 52 countries worldwide assembled in protest of the dangers of genetically modified foods. Now you'd think that something that garnered this much support worldwide would be covered in detail in the mainstream media. But you'd be wrong. Admittedly, many local news outlets gave the event a small blurb in the online edition of their papers at 10 o'clock at night on Saturday, but there was a virtual blackout of the event in the mainstream media, even though this was a huge global event with hundreds if not thousands of protesters marching down the busiest streets in major cities worldwide. The good news is that even though this march didn't garner much mainstream media coverage, the event itself grew beyond what even the event organizer was expecting through the power of social media. When Tammy Canal created the March Against Monsanto Facebook page three months ago, she said she would have considered it a success if even 3,000 people had joined. Instead, an incredible number of people responded and turned out to rally, showing the power of social networking and the ability of the little guy to mobilize en masse. People captured video of the event and uploaded it immediately to YouTube or Ustream. Anti-Monsanto-related hashtags continue to pour over the Twitter feeds, and the official Facebook page now has 157,000 likes, and it's growing. This is how ideas and movements are spread in the modern age. That is why it is so important for us to fight to maintain a free and open Internet. Even corrupt Monsanto execs and their paid-off politicians cannot stop the power of the sleeping giant once it awakens. Now here at InfoWars, we're going to continue to keep corrupt companies like Monsanto and other biotech giants in check. So visit InfoWars.com show for a variety of ways to share any of our anti-GMO stories and more. I'm Leanne McAdoo, and this has been an InfoWars Nightly News Alert. And Leanne brought up a very good point. If we don't have a free sharing internet, it's going to be hard to organize for events like this in the future. So definitely be aware of bills like CISPA and so forth. And call your representatives, anything that's already even been passed. Just say, 
hey, get this out of here, or next election cycle, you're out of here. We'll move on now to some other news. Illinois teacher in hot water after informing students of their Fifth Amendment rights. You can't have the teachers actually teaching the students anything. Let's see, a high school teacher's fans are rallying to support him as he faces possible discipline for advising students of their constitutional rights before taking a school survey on behavior. John Dryden, a social studies teacher, told some of his students on April 18th that they had a Fifth Amendment right to right not to incriminate themselves by answering questions on the survey which had each student's name printed on it. The survey asked about drug, alcohol, and tobacco use and emotions according to Brad Newkirk, chief academic officer. Now I'm not advocating teen delinquency, I'm not advocating drugs or alcohol or anything like that, but this teacher had a chance to teach his students something and put it into practice, say hey you guys have a Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate yourself with uh, by filling out this survey. Now these surveys can come back to haunt you, most notably athletes, once again not advocating any type of drug behavior, but hey, if you have a nice good scholarship and you fill out this thing with your name on it, it's not even anonymous, saying hey, you know, I'm Johnny and I, I like to smoke weed or whatever else, that could be the end of your scholarship and who's going to be held accountable for that? You, the school, is not going to help you out if you lose your scholarship. So just keep that thing in mind. Now we'll move on to some other nanny state news. Scotland, every child to have state guardian from birth. Every child in Scotland is to be assigned a state minder from birth under a draconian new proposals that would enable the government to spy on families under the justification of preventing child abuse. This state appointment, excuse me, appointed overseer will be a specific named individual and every child will have one from birth. The responsibility for creating this named guardian will fall on the heads of the health boards and the first five years of the child's life before being transferred to councils. So anybody who would think, well, you need a babysitter anyway. Well, if little Becky from down the street breaks into your liquor cabinet, you can tell her to hit the streets. On this, you're going to have some state-appointed guardian watching you wash your child, uh, bathe your child, take your kids out to soccer games. No, little Johnny, he's been outside too long. He can't be out here. And it's, it, this is a satire piece come to life because you think about how we, we've had the satire pieces and those on YouTube by the TSA agent watching you in the shower. This is what this is in real life. They're just trying to take over your kids and it's worse than putting your cam cameras in your home like they do in the UK. They're just going to have somebody live with you or not necessarily live with you but watch everything you do with your child interactions you know for the first five years of your life. Now let's move on to some even more bizarre news. Pressure cooker discovered at Dearborn Hotel. And, okay, pressure cooker, I'm sure it wasn't that big deal. Let's see. Police in Dearborn are trying to understand why a pressure cooker was left in a restroom in the Adobe Hotel, forcing evacuation of guests until the early morning hours. The pressure cooker discovered at the hotel was detonated by police as a precaution, but contained no, no, none, zero explosives. Dearborn officials have determined that the pressure cooker had not been converted into any type of explosive device. So, you know, if you have a pressure cooker, if you have kids taking tripods and pop tarts to school, we have to suspend the kids and shut down the school, and now we have to evacuate hotels and even blow up the pressure cooker because somebody left it in the bathroom. I mean, what was it doing there? I don't know. Maybe somebody just lost it. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, just blow it up. That's, you know, what you do now. You just completely freak out and overreact to every single situation. Now, let's move on to this. Man who died in Sacramento police custody identified. Cell phone video shows a violent struggle. An officer lying on top of a man as a female officer strikes the suspect with her baton. He wasn't really out of control. All he was moving was his feet. He couldn't move nothing else because the police officer was on top of the man. Minutes before the scuffle with police, officers say Toretti barricaded himself in this Metro PCS store off Folsom Boulevard. The woman working inside called 911, saying she was fearful for her life. Now, okay, I understand, let's say the guy broke into a store, locked himself in, scared the teller or whoever was in there into thinking that they were in fear for them, their lives. I understand that. Police were called. They uh, approached the man. It, the story says that the man may have been physically aggressive. The officers uh, physically detained the man, take him to the ground. I understand that. But when you have a man detained on the ground, have an officer, you know, bear hugging the guy on the ground while somebody beats his legs, later on the man dies, and they say, well, we're not exactly sure that the police interaction with the man had anything to do with his death. 
Okay, so if somebody dies from cancer and they smoke three packs a day, that's like saying, well, I'm not sure the cigarettes had anything to do with it. Maybe the cops didn't kill the guy, but it definitely didn't help him. And for more similar news, let's take a look at this. Police chief vows revenge after officer gunned down for no obvious reason. Bad. It wasn't an arrest that went bad, that, that someone actually took the time to plan it um, and set it up um, makes it that much more um, obviously hurtful, but it, it, uh, it makes you mad. It's an eye for an eye. You kill one of my guys, um, I'm not going to rest till I have you in, in cuffs or on the front side of a weapon, and I mean that. And at least the guy was honest about it because many people will take that clip and say, well, he said he wanted to have the guy in cuffs, but yeah, if you let the guy talk for two more seconds or in front of a gun, and he means that. He just told you he is very sincere about that statement. So once again, you know, I feel very sorry for this officer. He was gunned down in a scenario when he came to uh, clear out some trees and so forth, was ambushed, was killed, shot dead, never even had a chance to remove his weapon. So I do feel sorry for him, but that doesn't mean you can go out killing people and uh, you know, not giving them their due process. Now, our final story for the night is this, was Gibson Guitars also targeted by the IRS? And we'll have a special report on this in just one second, but first let's go to the article. News that the IRS targeted conservative groups for extra scrutiny could be the reason why a guitar manufacturer underwent a federal raid on their factory nearly two years ago, an editorial published at the Investor's Business Daily Claims. In 2011, the Gibson Guitar Factory, located in Nashville, Tennessee, was raided by federal agents who confiscated rosewood fingerboards of Indian and Madagascar origins. They said the wood violated an amendment to the Lacey Act, which outlawed the import of certain plants and plant products without an import declaration. In IBD editorial notes that, interestingly, the Gibson competitor, C.F. Martin & Co., had used the same type of Indian rosewood, but that, on the other hand, Martin had given hefty contributions of more than $35,000 to Democratic candidates. And for more on this, Alex Jones actually had an interview with the CEO of Gibson back in 2011. Under the Lacey Act, uh, and, and, and the federal government's on record, you know, now when you try to fly out of the country with a wooden guitar, they don't care how old it is, if you don't have the proof of, of where it came from, that they're they're confiscating them. Uh, can you speak to that? It, it, it's you know it's quite ridiculous. Uh, the fact is what it, the the law is is that you have to know what every material component in the product is and where it came from. So in other words, every single piece of wood, uh, the the bridge, the fingerboard, uh, the body. You know, these are all different woods that have come from different sources. You, as a guitar owner, if you want to transport that guitar across borders, have to know exactly where each uh, piece of wood came from and what species it is, uh, which is frankly impossible for an average person to know. Uh, and on an, an old guitar, we don't even know that. I mean, th that we don't keep records going back you know, decades uh, on, on the specifics. Well, well, I was reading, because it's not just Gibson, it's all the uh, wooden uh, instruments, violins, cellos, you name it, that people like Willie Nelson, who I know personally, they he won't take his prize wooden guitars out of the country. He won't take Trigger that he got over 60 years ago out of the country uh, because uh, reportedly they're, they're grabbing most of the guitars uh, people try to take into Canada or fly to Europe for a show. And, and now the feds are saying, uh, pianos, uh, furniture, uh, firearms stocks. I mean, this sounds like it's a giant power grab, and, and it looks like the U.S. is the only country in the world uh, acting like this with a renewable resource like wood. It is, it is really unprecedented, and it's unfair. Uh, it, it's, um, I, I just can't believe it's happening in this country. In closing, how can we support uh, a American icon company like Gibson? Uh, I mean, how do we keep you here in the U.S.? Because uh, doing my own investigation, if you're based overseas, you seem to get left alone. And it, it, our government just bends over backwards. Even Congressman Kucinich said two days ago on CNN 
that the head of the president's economic council, the former head of GE, uh, is great at creating jobs overseas, that a lot of the stimulus money and bailout money is going to move General Electric's X-ray division to China, uh, to move General Motors' factories to China. Uh, what's going on here? Well, you know, in, in the government itself, in a uh, brief, uh, specifically said uh, in, in our court case that we should move to Madagascar and make guitars. Excuse me? Oh, hold, 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 hold the presses, sir. CEO of Gibson, since 1986, you're telling me, and, and I know you've got these uh, uh, press release on Gibson, but I would love to see a copy of this, I believe you, that they, spe they specifically said, leave America. That we would be better off manufacturing guitars in Madagascar. Wow. And they told you that via a court brief? Yes. I haven't seen this in the press yet. This is bombshell. Uh, you've got to get a press release out, or perhaps you already have. We, we're, we're working on it, and uh, yeah, we'll have the actual document. Wow. Gibson Guitar told basically, leave America. So from being raided to being targeted by the IRS, somebody has their sights on Gibson. So let's go now to our quote of the day. This from Thomas Jefferson. Our country is now taking so a steady course as to show by what road it will pass destruction, to wit, by consolidation of power first, and then corruption, its necessary consequence. And that from Thomas Jefferson. Now be sure to stay tuned after this break. We'll be right back. Dave Knight's going to be in this chair interviewing Miss Karen Hughes, the World Bank whistleblower. She was on the Alex Jones radio show today, and she has more insight for us. But first, if you like this broadcast and you'd like to see it continue, stop by prisonplanet.tv and get yourself a 15-day free trial. The Alex Jones radio show, the nightly news, it's all right there waiting for you. And you guys know Bilderberg is coming up soon, so stay tuned to Infowars.com and also prisonplanet.com. We will be launching a new site. Bilderberg Central, that's not the name of it, but you know that's basically the gist of it, so you can keep up with all things Bilderberg. So stay tuned right after this break with David Knight. As we saw in Katrina, and as we are watching now in New York and New Jersey, the federal government can't and won't help you in a crisis. FEMA ran out of water and MREs in days. Electricity is still off to over one million people. The Red Cross, who is quick to beg for money, is now slow to react. Don't put it off any longer. Get prepared today. The InfoWars Shop is the largest distributor of ProPure water filter systems. And now, get 15% off your ProPure order with the promo code WATER15. While you're on InfoWarsShop.com, check out these other great preparedness items. The Aquapod Kit lets you store up to 65 gallons of water in your bathtub. The Pocket Socket provides you with manual electricity for small electronics like your cell phone. The Life Straw is great for your bug out bag. And check out our complete line of inner food products for great tasting and nutritionally dense foods that have a great shelf life. If you are looking to secure your home in a crisis, you can order Strategic Relocations the film. A great companion to the book Strategic Relocations 3rd Edition and The Secure Home by Joel Skousen. When the time to perform arrives, the time to prepare has already passed. Get prepared now, so if a crisis strikes your home, you and your family will be secure. Go to InfoWarsShop.com and don't forget the promo code WATER15. I'm Darren McBreen, and these are some of the new items that are available now at InfoWarsShop.com. Alert the public to Obama's blatant abuse of power with the new Obama t-shirt. Obama's joker face on the front and come and take it on the back. It's time to publicly call him out for what he is, a tyrant. Defend the Second Amendment with our top seller come and take it t-shirts. And look at that, women's cut tank tops and t-shirts now available. Nice hat. Plus, the Don't Tread on Me flag. And now, you can become a micro-distributor of the InfoWars magazine. Plus, get your own copy delivered right to your door each and every month. 
And if you're tired like I am of you and your family being exposed to polluted drinking water, get the Pro One High Performance Water Filter. It gets rid of all pathogenic bacteria, cysts, fluoride, heavy metals, and numerous other contaminants. So join the revolution at InfoWarsShop.com. Well, it's a familiar story about corruption and whistleblowers who pointed out and then having the government come after them, threatening them, firing them, taking other measures. And we've got someone with us tonight that is a whistleblower at the World Bank. She's talking about the corruption that she saw there and how it went ignored and unaddressed. And now she is actually being attacked by Eric Holder and the Department of Justice for something that is not really even in their jurisdiction. Now, a lot of our viewers are familiar with the Federal Reserve, but they may not be familiar with the World Bank. So just to catch you up a little bit on that, the World Bank was created in 1944, and the principal stakeholders in that were the United States and the UK. Now, in the first uh, years of the World Bank from 44 to 68, it was mostly financing income-producing infrastructure in, in countries. Then in 68 to 80, there was a change. At that point, Robert McNamara became the head of the World Bank. He was appointed by LBJ at the end of that administration. And instead of pr uh, financing mostly income-producing infrastructure, they started financing social services. And as a result, third world debt soared increasing at an average annual rate of 20% a year. And then the next phase we see is the World Bank coming in and offering loans to these same third world banks that have been impoverished in debt. We see them coming in and offering to uh, service that debt for them. Now, the lady that we're going to be talking to is Karen Hughes. She worked at the World Bank in the legal department for 20 years. And she saw some questionable loan practices there. She brought those up. She was transferred. Then she was fired. And subsequent appeals went unheeded by the World Bank and often by areas of the federal government. We're going to talk to her about that right now. Well, welcome, Karen. Thank you for talking to InfoWars. It's uh, always an honor to talk to somebody who is a whistleblower out of a concern for integrity and, and to see that the right thing is done. And your personal story, I think, is as important as what has happened with the AP reporters or with the IRS scandals, because we see the same sort of thing happening, where somebody sees something that's wrong, or they're investigating something that, that may be wrong or an embarrassment to the government, and instead of correcting the problem, of course, the government comes after them. And so that's essentially what they've done with you. Tell us a little bit about the, uh, your background there at the World Bank and, and what you were doing prior to uh, the discovery of corruption there. I was a lawyer in the World Bank legal department and I was just doing my job as a lawyer in the institution. And so when they started to um, retaliate and the retaliation was very specific and very direct, I was put on probation twice. It was an attempt to intimidate me. And at a certain point it was an attempt to make an example out of me to make sure that other people who were also seeing corruption wouldn't report that either. And let's talk about that corruption that you saw. You actually saw some corruption involving a loan to the Philippines government, is that correct? Yes, as a matter of fact, the president of the Philippines, Joseph Estrada, was impeached. Mm -hmm. And he had to pay back uh, millions of dollars that he had stolen from the Philippines people. And actually, I think at the heart of this, there was a default with a major bank there that uh, I believe was around $900 million that uh, went back on the taxpayers of the Philippines, is that correct? Uh, well, it was $500 million in terms of the bailout because the people who had their money on deposit in Philippines National Bank got nervous. What had happened was the man who owned Philippine Airline, Lucio Tan, uh, was a, a borrower in default. And he bought the shares of the uh, Philippine National Bank and the depositors didn't want to have their money on deposit in a bank which was managed by a borrower in default. And so they took their money out, and the Philippine Deposit Insurance Corporation had to bail out the bank for $500 million. And then the World Bank had uh, $200 million of a loan that had to be canceled because the government didn't comply with the conditions. And then there was matching 
uh, financing from Japan, and that also got canceled. Now, so you, it added up this, to 900 million. You saw this coming up, and, and you blew the whistle on that. You said, this doesn't meet our standards of, of loans. Is that correct? You yes, I wrote a Bank. letter that I wanted the World Bank to give to the government of the Philippines, warning them that we would not be able to disperse the loan because the conditions weren't being met. The conditions, there were two conditions that weren't being met. One was they were supposed to strengthen their banking supervision. And it's certainly not banking supervision when a borrower in default buys the bank. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they were supposed to change their legislation. And, and the other condition was that that Philippines National Bank was supposed to be privatized. And when you're selling shares, employee shares, to a borrower in default, that is not privatizing. What now, happened was there weren't enough this, shares left. Now, when you saw this, you reported this to the uh, World Bank uh, Audit Committee, the audit, the, the audit Committee of the World Bank, right? And then two days later, they fired you? Uh, what happened was I went to see Jim Wolfenson, who was the president of the World Bank at the time, together with the man who represented the Dutch government. And we said that we're, there was this problem in the legal department that I was getting reassigned when I was doing my job. And Jim Wolfenson said he would handle it. And his, his way of handling it was to give the problem, to tell my boss that I'd been up to complain about him. <laughs> and so then I went to the Treasury Department and I told the Treasury Department that if the uh, U.S. management was not going to play by the rules, that the other countries in the World Bank were going to uh, make sure that we wouldn't automatically appoint the president of the World Bank. For the first 66 years, the World Bank was created in 1944, mm -hmm. and for the first 66 years, the U.S. could just name whoever they wanted to as the president. Because but the I U.S. is a major shareholder in the World Bank, is that correct? We were, uh, yeah, 16 percent. But when the World Bank was set up, we were uh, one of the two countries that set it up. The U.K. was the other country. And then 44 countries came to um, a place in New, uh, New Hampshire called Bretton Woods. That's why the World Bank and the IMF are called the Bretton Woods institutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you continued to, even though they reassigned you and then subsequently fired you, you continued to push this. And uh, you sent it to the, uh, took it to the Senate. Is that correct? Also uh, to the That's Congress. That's right. I went to the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, and I told uh, that was then chaired by Joe Biden, and uh, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were senators on that committee. And I warned them that we were going to lose the ability to appoint the president of the World Bank, that there was corruption going on, that when people inside the World Bank cannot report that there are accounting problems, which is what that is, uh, there was a cover-up to the board. And you can't have a cover-up to the board in a bank because money goes the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Now, when they came out of this, the, actually the Senate uh, sent letters to the World Bank, and they essentially ignored that, right, as well as firing someone else, uh, a, a lawyer for the uh, Staff Association. Oh, they fired a whole slew of people, and it wasn't just letters. They also commissioned a government accountability audit because this was major, major corruption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was, wasn't there legislation also passed by Congress? There is legislation in effect now. Um, they, the World Bank came to Congress and asked for some money. And Congress said, not as long as the GAO audit is not going forward and you're firing whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. we, huh. we have to do some oversight here. We have to be serious about this. And they also took very much to heart um, the uh, warning that I had given them, which was that the U.S. had lost its credibility with 188 ministers of finance. Now, Paul, this is not a good thing. Right. Now, Paul Volcker, former uh, head of the Fed, also got involved, didn't he? And wasn't his involvement to essentially say, move along, there's nothing to see here? Uh, yes. What happened was the Dutch government asked for the audit committee to get involved. And uh, Pierre Duquesne, who was the chairman of the audit committee, commissioned uh, Paul Volcker to come in and look at this corruption. And what happened was uh, there's uh, something called the Institutional Integrity Department that's supposedly there to fight corruption. What that group does is it serves as a goon squad to intimidate any staff member that's going to report that there's an, uh, a fraud. This is uh, a terrible problem. So this and is so there were 16 staff members who were members of the um, Institutional Integrity Department that tried to tell Paul Volcker what was going on. And they got retaliated against, and they ended up with um, being compensated for how they were being um, retaliated against. So we have but, this major financial 
institution that we've got a major stake in, as the uh, U.S. citizens do, the taxpayers do. And they're doing questionable loan procedures of hundreds of millions of dollars, billions in many cases. And whenever there's corruption and people blow the whistle on it, they're getting fired. Congress is sending them letters saying that they can't retaliate against people. They're ignoring that. And yet the mainstream media didn't pick up on this at all. Uh, it gets worse. It gets yeah. worse. The World Bank issues bonds, $180 billion worth of bonds. And the financial statements of the World Bank are not credible when you have this kind of um, retaliation against lawyers and accountants. So I went to the SEC and I, uh, I didn't get anywhere. I said there's been uh, the audit committee has commissioned an external audit of the controls. And that auditor, that was KPMG, didn't follow the audit standards. I said, so the United States is not credible. And there's something called the National Advisory Council, which has uh, the chairman of the Fed on it. It's chaired by the Treasury Department. And I reported, I wrote, I wrote them many times. And I said, you know, the United States is losing its financial integrity and credibility. And the dollar is going to be um, not a credible instrument. And the U.S. credit rating is going to be a problem. Absolutely. And what I ultimately documented is something very, very serious, which is called state capture. Because if the SEC is not regulating the market, then why should anybody invest in the security market? And so what, um, what bothered me was the serious nature of the charges and the fact that the media wasn't covering it. Absolutely. And I later found out what the problem was. And that is that our media is absolutely dominated by these crooks. Absolutely, yeah. That's something that we've been talking about for quite some time. And everybody is starting to come to the same conclusion, seeing the same thing. Here you've got a situation where, to recap it for the viewers, you've got hundreds of billions of dollars in bonds. You've got questionable loans being made. Anytime anybody questions that, or brings it up or points it out, they're fired or retaliated against. You've got Congress saying, don't do that. This is much, much bigger than the bank scandals and bank failures that we had in 2008, yet there's total silence from the mainstream media. You listed in your article, you talked about the different uh, organizations that passed on this story. New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, NPR, Forbes, the Broadcasting Board of Governors, the National Press Club, Basically, nobody in the mainstream media picked that up, and you now know why. Tell the audience why. Okay, there's a very accurate analysis of the markets, which was done by the, um, it's a, a university in Switzerland, which is known as the best university in Europe. It's called the Federal Institute of Technology. What they did was they got very accurate data on who owns all of the 40,000 uh, transnational companies. And they did mathematical modeling, systems modeling, and they found out that when we think that there are 10 banks, guess what? With interlocking corporate directorates, they are one conglomerate entity. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. So we, we have got, um, what have we got? We've got um, a dominant super entity that has 40% of the um, companies on on the stock markets and 60% of their earnings. Now, they don't have that much money. I mean, they have a lot of money, but not that much. It's just the clever way that they have made their investments mm -hmm. with, through the interlocking directorates. And you point out that at the core of all this, the heart of all this is really the Federal Reserve. Well, it yeah. is the entities that own the Federal Reserve mm -hmm. and the central banks in the other countries. Mm -hmm. Right. And the, uh, the clearinghouse, essentially, for all this is, as Carol Quigley pointed out, and you quote this uh, in the article, or at least it's in the New American, I'm not sure if it's a quote from them or from you, but you said that uh, this club of private central bankers, the Bank for International Settlements that's in Switzerland, uh, that is a private bank that is owned and controlled by the world's central banks, which are themselves private banks. Yes, it's all that, it's all that same uh, ball of wax. Right. And so essentially these people also, as they uh, have the largest ownership, uh, I think it was 47% of the world's stocks and 60% of the profits, and they own this consolidated media environment that we find ourselves in, where it's consolidated down now to just five 
different institutions that own pretty much all the mainstream media in the U.S. But let's go back just briefly to your whistleblower story, because after this story got no traction whatsoever in the press, you continued to press this. You continued to try to get justice done. You sued them. You bought a, a bond so that you would have standing, and then you sued the World Bank. Tell us about that. Okay, but let me say first of all that I was not acting alone. There is a very active group of World Bank whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I mean, just, just think of um, a dream team where one person's good at one thing and one person's good at something else. I was their lawyer, um, not formally, we're, we're sort of an informal group. But I testified in the UK Parliament twice because there's a UK whistleblower. All right. I went to a conference in India because there's an Indian whistleblower. And, uh, you know, we, we would all figure out who could who could who was situated at what point to do what that's um, great. Uh, and, and that's you know that's and we stuck with it that's great yeah we should get some of those people on the show as well now Definitely. tell us about this lawsuit that you filed and what happened to that okay it was really fun actually I'm you know I'm not a litigator but um, I mean I, that's what I did I bought a bond and I sued KPMG which was the auditing firm that didn't follow the audit standards. And one of the things, by the way, that I picked up in this is that the accountants should not be policing themselves and neither should the lawyers. Because yeah. there were any number of times that if, if these policing, self-policing entities had been ethical, uh, the problem would have righted itself. So everybody that thinks we've got people watching out for us, no, we don't. That was what I discovered in my lawsuit. And one of the things that happened, for example, was there was a filing deadline. I went the night before, midnight before the filing deadline, and I read the brief one more time. Somebody had hacked my computer. Huh. It was gone. And um, I, I later went and I complained about it to the FBI. Um, <laughs> that's illegal. They you might can't have been the ones who did it. <laughs> the yeah. FBI well, might have been the so, ones who did so it. Eric Holder, you know, cutting... <laughs> Fast forward, Eric Holder is dragging me into court on bogus charges now. Not, he's a, you know, that's where the FBI reports. They report to him. Well, and let's talk about that. Because uh, now, you, we didn't mention this either, but uh, the UK has a serious fraud office. They had asked the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC here in the U.S., for information about this. The, US, the SEC just ignored that. Uh, you also appealed to the Inspector General of the Treasury Department back in 2010. Now, that's familiar to a lot of people who are looking at the IRS scandal. That's the Inspector General's Office of the Treasury Department investigating the IRS. And basically, they didn't do anything about it. But what's interesting about your arrest and the legal issues involved here is that you had a, uh, the Board of Directors and the Board of Governors gave you a pass to attend their meeting. Is that correct? Not only that, they settled my lawsuit. Hmm. And the clerk in the Court of Appeals just ignored 188 ministers of finance. They didn't like that, believe me. You know, and I have been writing the embassies of all of these countries. They're all aware, very well aware. And a lot of them are saying, Karen, why aren't you getting through to the American people? And I didn't know why I wasn't getting through. I, it, it's because of this media problem that we have here. And right. what I'm talking about, state capture. Now, the board of directors gives you a pass to come to the meeting. But the U.S. Secret Service tells you you can't come. And I find that very interesting that U.S. Secret Service would get involved in this. Uh, you know, when they don't really have a standing in this, there's 188 members, uh, member nations, and you've got a board of directors that extends an invitation to you, and then the U.S. Secret Service says you can't come. You emailed your invitation to them, but they disregarded that, the police commissioner, and they arrested you when you showed up there. Is that correct? Yes, but I, it, you know, don't forget, I'm a lawyer. So I didn't just email the Secret Service. I cleared my email first with all 188 ministers of finance. I said, this is the letter that I am sending to the director of the Secret Service, saying that my case was settled, saying that I have a valid pass. And, uh, and then I sent the letter. And then when I showed up and they wouldn't let me in, what they did was they went to a flunky in the World Bank and they had the flunky sign a piece of paper saying, you are barred from coming in. I said, with all due respect, um, this flunky cannot overrule 188 ministers of finance. Yeah. This, this piece of paper is invalid. Yeah. And then when I went back to the World Bank the following week, uh, what I did was 
I sent a whole bunch of correspondence and I was copying all of the officials on the board of the World Bank and also the board of governors saying, if you have any doubt whether this, this barring notice is legal, just ask these guys whether they settled my lawsuit. And so then when I showed up and I was arrested, I was I was practically apoplectic. They put me in handcuffs. They put me in a car right in front of the World Bank as a spectacle. And they left me there for an hour. And I have a bionic elbow. I, I broke my elbow. And so it wasn't very comfortable to have these handcuffs with my, you know, arms behind yeah. my back. Yeah, it's not comfortable then, to be handcuffed even if you don't have something wrong. Actually, you know, it, it, the story's really cute. There were two police officers when I was arrested. And the first one said, okay, if you think that you're legally in the World Bank, then why don't you go back and discuss this with Commissioner Michael Reese? And so I was walking out of the building, you know, I was gonna go and discuss this, and the second guy is the one that arrested me. So then when I was in the cop car, I said to um, Officer Lee, I said, Officer Lee, you don't wanna be in the middle of this. Why don't you have the guy who's arresting me be the one with his name on the arrest? So she did that. Wow. I find it amazing that they would get the Secret Service involved in this. And then what's happening now, you've got a court uh, date coming up on the 30th. And That's right. Eric Holder is getting involved in this. This is not a federal crime, unlawful entry. And yet they're making, literally making a federal case out of it. I, I find it amazing what links they'll go to to try to shut you up. Well, they thought they would intimidate me, but I don't work that way. I was captain of the NYU fencing team. Um, I'm just looking to see what foot they're on. And so don't forget this, this citation to appear in court. By the way, if, if they don't call this thing off, I'd like some company there. It's on the 30th, and it's at 10 o'clock, and I'm in courtroom C10 of the Superior Court of the District of Columbia Criminal Division. And my charge is that I have violated the um, the DC statute. So I've been in touch with um, the general counsel of the District of Columbia Council, and I've given him all the documents. And I've said, you know, this is, um, this is kind of bad lawyering if the person who has signed this notice doesn't have authority. Uh, why don't you get involved here? And he said, well, I don't think it really is anything that involves me. I said, you know, this is um, a corrupt business environment, and maybe the World Bank and DC's biggest employer ought to take notice that they're working in uh, an environment riddled with corruption. This is corruption. Oh, absolutely. Well, we have the District of Columbia ignoring a Supreme Court ruling for five years about firearms and the Second Amendment. So it doesn't really surprise us in that regard. Let's move on to the corruption that you saw there. Now, you've you made a lot of statements about how the global financial system is dominated by a small group of corrupt, power-hungry figures centered around the privately owned Federal Reserve. Tell us what you saw there firsthand that convinced you of that. Well, just think of this project in the Philippines that I'm working on where the president of the Philippines is corrupt. By the way, um, the government of the Philippines at the time, I was working on judicial reform with the Chief Justice, Hilario Davide, who wrote the Constitution in the Philippines, was a fabulous man, was trying to clean up his government. So if the World Bank is not helping him by having the lawyer reassigned, that is corruption of a huge scale. Just think about it, millions and millions of dollars that ought to go to fight corruption in the Philippines is going to line uh, Estrada's pocket. And, yeah. and the government actually, when they, um, after they impeached him, they tried him and they took back the corruption. They, they, re, uh, they repossessed a lot of the, the things that he had uh, put the corrupt money in. So this, this is clearly showing the corruption. Now, the other whistleblowers that I'm talking about, these are people that were reporting accounting violations where money that was supposed to go one place, went another place. And when they reported it, they were retaliated against. And when you have that, what that does is that provides a disincentive for other people that see money going the wrong way. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not and just... There was, yeah, it's not I was just, just going to say something about the Institutional Integrity Department. Mm -hmm. This is a group that acted like a goon squad. Hmm. They, they, weren't, they weren't investigating corruption. They were investigating people who were trying to prevent corruption. 
Well, it doesn't really surprise us, I guess, when we see things like going on in the European Union where they put technocrats in charge and essentially suspend elections in countries because of debt that they owe, that they've now, you know, first the banks fail out of uh, corruption and questionable accounting practices. They put that debt on the public and then they say, you owe us so much money, we're now going to take over your government. I mean, we're seeing not only corruption, but we're seeing subversion on a wide scale of the sovereignty of nations. Some of the most outspoken critics of this have been the UK Independence Party, UKIP, Nigel Farage uh, in the European Union. And now we see that uh, there's an article that just broke in The Guardian that says that the EU exit would put U.S. trade deal at risk, Britain is warned, by the Obama administration. And what they're threatening to do is they're essentially blackmailing the uh, United Kingdom to stay, into the, uh, stay in the EU, saying that they're going to, to take away this deal that encompasses half of the world's GDP and a third of its trade. They're essentially blackmailing the U.K. with the paper money that the Fed is printing because we've been off of the gold standard for quite some time. And you've got a lot to say about the gold standard as well. That's right. Tell us a little bit about that. All right. Well, let's, let's look first at this um, Inspector General's report that the Treasury uh, Department gave to the Germans when the Germans asked to see their gold. Mm -hmm. The Germans didn't like um, to get a paper audit when all they wanted to do was to see their gold, which was in storage in the Federal Reserve. And that was just so back the in Germans, January. That's right. So the Germans asked for their gold back. Now this, and, and what the Germans were told was, you can have it maybe in seven years. Now this is an act of war. Right. This is an act of war. This is extremely serious. Yeah, a lot of nations, as the viewers may or may not know, a lot of nations turned their gold over to the U.S. for safekeeping after World War II. And supposedly it's in Fort Knox, but even though a lot of congressmen have asked to see it, even though the Germans have demanded its return, the U.S. isn't showing anybody. They're not showing us their cars and they're not showing us the gold. And so a lot of people have suggested that perhaps it's not there. Well, what this gets back to is the credibility of the Treasury Department. Right. The Treasury Department was supposed to give a report on the World Bank for the uh, World Bank to qualify for the U.S. capital increase. The Treasury Department was supposed to say whether or not there was substantial improvement in overcoming the retaliation against whistleblowers. So uh, in November, uh, Secretary Geithner lied to Congress. So I went to each of the members of the appropriations committees and I told them what was really happening as opposed to what Secretary Geithner had said. So when you have this level of um, lack of credibility, you, how can the Germans accept the Treasury Department's um, word for that the, the, their gold is there? Their word is worthless. Mm -hmm. And it's contempt of Congress when Secretary Geithner is lying about whether or not whistleblowers are made whole at the World Bank. Now, in a correspondence that you sent out uh, yesterday, uh, you said it is necessary to bring the World Bank's $180 billion in bonds into compliance on the world capital market before permanent backwardation in gold interrupts world commerce. Explain to us what you mean by gold backwardization. Okay, it is the fact that people don't trust the credibility of the Treasury Department. And so how are their dollars? How, how can people trust whether or not the dollars are worth anything if they cannot b take the word of the U.S. government? And right. they can't. They, the government has been caught lying. And when, when three, after I was fired, three senators asked for a GAO audit, or not an audit. They wanted the GAO to look into corruption at the World Bank. Senators Luger, Leahy, and Bai, they asked for this in 2008. And the World Bank stonewalled. So there, there's something called the um, uh, International Organization of Supreme Audit Institutions. That group knows everything about the GAO audit not going forward. Um, there's something called the International Organization of Securities Commissioners. That group knows everything about the problems when the serious fraud office called up the SEC and the SEC stonewalled. So what you have is you have people in the country thinking that the United States is a beacon of light. And what you actually have is you have this terrible rot. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. We've seen this over and over again. If we look at the Benghazi situation, 
That didn't get any traction until whistleblowers came forward, and now it's gotten a lot of traction. Still remains to be seen whether anything is going to be done to reform uh, the government systemically or institutionally. Where do you see this going, this particular scandal? You're finally starting to get some traction, at least in the alternative media. Uh, we didn't catch up on the story until uh, just today. But, uh, and it's just been the last week, I think, that you've started to get uh, some traction in that story. Where do you see this headed? Actually, I think it's already uh, just about solved. Because although I could not get through to the um, public, I could get through to the state attorneys general because the states are required to protect bondholders in their states. There's blue sky securities laws. So I got through to the states big time. I got through to the governors. And I also got through to the chief justices of the state Supreme Courts. Because when the, um, the Board of Governors settled my suit and the clerk in the Court of Appeals ignored that, I went to the judicial conference, which is chaired by the chief justice of the Supreme Court. And I told uh, John Roberts that if he didn't start straightening things out, we were going to have a currency war. And I could say this quite accurately, although when I testified in the UK Parliament, that told me that the chances that I was going to break through this um, conspiracy of silence were excellent. They were like 90 percent. It was only a question of when. And the fact that the cover up went to this extent was actually quite helpful because what it did was it diagnosed the state capture. It diagnosed the fact that the, that the Securities and Exchange Commission was um, that there were two kinds of investors. The big investors that could do insider trading, including the Federal Reserve, and the little ones who would who would have to pick up the pieces. Now, when I you mean, talk about state capture, let, let's pick up on that term because yeah, that, that's something that actually is beyond crony capitalism. When we think of crony capitalism, we look at it as a particular corporation or institution that is getting special favors from the government. You're talking about the government actually being taken captive by these corrupt organizations. When that's about exactly what I'm talking about. And if you go on my website, you will see the letters that I'm writing to the various entities telling them that if you don't report this at this point, that is state capture. When I called it state capture, I, and I don't use that, I'm, I'm a lawyer, I don't use that term wildly. This was during the presidential election when you had um, Barack Obama um, campaigning against Mitt Romney, who had a lot of money coming in from outside, and Mitt Romney's um, uh, national security advisor was Robert Zellick, who the board didn't want to reappoint for a second term as president because president of this of the, corruption. He had been president of the World Bank, Robert Zellick, had been, and, and had right. not gotten a second appointment because of corruption, and yet he was uh, Romney's, what, financial advisor? What was his position there? He was, he was the uh, National uh, Security Transition Planning Chief. And I asked CBS to have a question during the presidential debate about this corruption. And CBS knew all about the corruption because um, during the David Letterman interview of um, Cameron, they raked Cameron over the coals about what had happened to Andrew Mitchell, who was fired as the, um, the man in charge of the development aid in the UK. Because the UK gave a lot of money, and here was all this corruption at the World Bank, and here was this problem with a serious fraud office getting stonewalled by the SEC. So CBS knew all about the corruption and was able to rake David Cameron over the over the coals. Um, at, at one point, what happened with um, Mitchell was um, Mitchell, after he was fired, there was something called Plebgate. They were just giving him a terribly hard time in the UK. So here's CBS, who knows exactly what the story is, and yet they're not putting this question during the presidential election when it's so relevant for the choice of who's going to be your president. Right. So that's well, state let's, capture. Let's, let's, uh, let's kind of wrap this up. Now, this, where we stand right now, we still don't have any mainstream media covering this yet, but uh, you're getting a lot more exposure in the alternative media. Uh, you still haven't had the federal government do any, res they're basically ignoring this, and there's not really been any fundamental change in structure with the federal government or with the World Bank. 
but you feel that things are starting to turn because you have uh, informed uh, at the state level, you've informed right. uh, attorney generals and courts and that sort of thing as to what's happening. Have they done anything? Or uh, to, to, yes. to, okay, tell us about that. All right. Um, you've seen a number of state militias. This is not an easy thing for the state governors to do. They've been getting uh, national security warning letters, but they're signing this legislation. You see um, a number of states that are now moving to have uh, the precious metals recognized as legal tender. Utah has done this and 12 other legislatures are considering this. So the, yes, the states are very, and I, I had a conversation with um, the states before I went on coast to coast mm -hmm. uh, to find out, you know, just, just to let them know that I was gonna be talking about these things and that I was having this problem with Eric Holder. And let's get back into the backwardation. This is, this is something that makes me um, nervous, but also makes me realize that we are gonna to come to a good, happy resolution. Backwardation is when you don't sell your gold because you're afraid that the paper currency is not gonna be worth what your gold was. And we're starting to approach that situation. And if you get into that situation, you don't have a way to finance international trade and the world goes into a meltdown. So I've been warning the governments that the time to correct this problem is now. And I've gone to uh, the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff about this. That's what I was talking to them. Uh, you know, I said, we're, you know, we're, what, what's, your, what's your plan here? Um, do you want to go into gold backwardation? Do you want to um, go back into the Middle Ages with bartered trade? Is this where you're headed? And they said, are you asking us whether we want to have martial law? I said, no. I said, what I want you to do is I want you to look at what's going on, take a long, hard look at what's going on, and I want you to laugh Eric Holder out of office. So the first thing they responded to you was, do you want us to have martial law? That's one of the concerns that we've had is that they're looking at an implosion and that they look at the only way that this is, they're going to get out of this is to basically come down with an iron fist on everybody as everything implodes. You're hoping that perhaps they may go back and uh, reform themselves so that they now have the full faith and credit and they can continue on a paper currency? Is that what you see as a way out of this? No, no. Okay. I'm, I'm really not very interested in what they want to do. Mm -hmm. I think, they, I think they've um, shown themselves to be pigs at the trough that are not apt to understand how they're coming across to the rest of the world. They're blind to that or they would have seen this coming and they would have just realized that they had to be subject to law. But there's a very easy way out that has nothing to do with them. And that is for the states themselves. Um, there are all kinds of things the states can do. They can um, establish state uh, banks if they want. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. In any event- Which we have in North Dakota, I believe, something to that effect. That's yeah. right. There, there are any number, uh, but the, the, the issue is that we are running out of time. Mm -hmm. um, but what you have is you have all of the countries of the world that understand this and we're all pulling together. It's, it's a coalition and it's really quite um, dramatic and beautiful to see how this, I've gotten a number of uh, phone calls from the embassies that I faxed. If you look at what I've been faxing them, I've been explaining to them uh, about all of the articles that have come out now and these interviews that I'm getting and they're all quite encouraged. I think, I think the American public is, is really, um, they're, they're starting to understand that they've got a, um, <laughs> they've well, got to hold their government accountable. As you said, we're running out of time. That, that's true in our interview, but it's also true for the country as well. And I certainly hope that people wake up and demand that there be a fix. And I, I agree with you that the best place that we can fix this is outside of Washington, because Washington is just so incredibly corrupt, and we see that over and over again. There appears to be no interest whatsoever from either party to address the systemic corruption that we find there. Instead, they just come after whistleblowers like you. So we hope that uh, things go well on your 30th, uh, May 30th court date, and uh, that's in D.C. And uh, do you want to give your website information or any yeah, more information it's, uh, about that before we go? www. K-A-H-U-D-E-S dot net. And just one last thing, the federal government, don't forget, they did pass that legislation with a condition on the capital increase that whistleblowers be made whole. So there's, you know, it's not a, a total throw the baby out with the bathwater. Good. There's a baby there. Yeah, yeah, there, there are some good senators there. 
Well, thank you very much for talking to us, Karen Hewitt. And thank you so much for standing up and doing the right thing and being vocal about it and pressing it. That, that's, I think, the greatest hope that we've got is that people like you who are on the inside, who see things that are wrong, not only speak up about it, but are persistent and have a backbone when the system turns against them. And you certainly have done that. And you certainly have our gratitude. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Well, it's vitally important that we keep alternative media alive and well. Uh, InfoWars is certainly a key player in the alternative media. And one of the ways that you can help us is by getting a subscription to Prison Planet TV. Just one subscription will let you share that with up to 10 people simultaneously. So it helps get the information out, the news that is not being covered, as we just talked about, the news that's not being covered by the mainstream media. You know, that uh, vast media conglomerate that's only owned by five different companies. Uh, we're very independent, but we depend on your contribution, your support to maintain that independence. Well, that's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern.